course, you have um, a very big problem on the left, which is not just nihilism, but this uh, puritanism when it comes to forming these coalitions. Uh, Tribalism. Saw, saw what happened to Andrew, uh, particularly when he ran for mayor. Uh, I, we mentioned this on the podcast the other day. You know, everybody wanted to really focus in on the comments he made in regards to Israel. And if you disagree with that, um, you can disagree, obviously, with, um, you know, the uh, private consulting firm that he was working with. But when it came to the primary issues, especially when it came to not just UBI and the test, um, you know, the testing that he's done, which has been very effective. You know, the fact that he was the one candidate who was advocating for the New York Health Act. And let's face it, Capitol Hill's broken. It looks like a lot of the policies that we really want are going to have to come through at the state level. And there's precedent for that, not just passing universal health care in Canada, but passing a lot of policies at the state level, whether it mm -hmm. is legalization of cannabis, whether it is marriage equality. It's been proven to be done already. And so the fact that he was the only candidate that was pushing for that, I thought was immensely important and way more important. But then everybody was like throwing him under the bus. It's like he was like the worst guy running. Because and we all know that the mayor of New York has a in very important impact on the validity of the state of Israel. I, I really do think <laughs> that the, the nihilism, and this is the thing that the left really doesn't understand, is that when you don't understand what it means to build coalitions, you end yeah. up with a Mayor Eric Adams. That's how that happens. Um, and the other thing that Andrew did, as alluding to that point, he was the only person who took full advantage of ranked choice voting. He says, exactly. well, if I don't get it, I want the person who is to probably going to do the most damage control out of anybody, and that would be Catherine Garcia. Now, Catherine didn't seem like she reciprocated it, but anybody yeah. who's paying attention recognizes what Andrew did. Yeah. And he was this close to preventing Adams from becoming mayor. If he didn't do what he did, it wouldn't have even been close. But he selflessly said, look, if it can't be me, let it at least be somebody who will not yes. do as much damage as Andrew's Eric did. a team player. And I really hope that more people start to wake up and realize that he may not be all of what you want, but yes. my goodness, is he on our side. Yeah, and so part of that problem was that people still don't understand how ranked choice voting works. It's so new that strategies weren't built around this. and. So I was hoping that that through the race itself that people would catch on. Um, it was so it really bothered me when you know I watched both of the the debates and each time they asked the question, you know, who would you rank below you? Um, and so you know everyone except for Yang and I can't remember who else um, one other time said that they would vote for somebody. Everyone just gave the answer as oh. I'm just going to vote for myself or I just don't think there's anyone else. You know, it's like they completely there's no reason at all why Eric Adams should have won, because all you all it needed was three people to get together yeah. and say, we are an alliance. And if you don't vote for me, vote for them. And Eric Adams would not have won. But see, people are so feckless, like they just they just really they're not thinking about the big picture. They're not thinking about what they say they're really concerned about. They're really concerned about themselves because every single one of those people absolutely knows who they would rather be if it weren't them. Every one of them knows that. They just don't have the balls to say it. We unfortunately had a situation just like that, and I wish the campaign got more attention. Oh, but just uh, today. She Sheila Scherflos McCormick, who you may have heard of, um, you know, she ran for Congress in the uh, open district, Florida's 20th congressional district. She was endorsed by no. uh, a <laughs> brand new Congress. And that obviously was a big deal. Um, she didn't get as much support as I would have liked. I mean, we really pushed for it. But at the end of the day, we had an opportunity to support her through the Progressive Caucus in the state. And there was another gentleman who was running. But the one thing that I made very clear to them, because these two candidates were the two non-corporate candidates running in the race, and they both had a lot of great policies that they were running on. Sheila happened to be running specifically on Medicare for All, UBI, and a living wage. And had run twice prior and, and had name recognition in mm -hmm. this district. The gentleman who decided to jump into the race was somebody who was really new to the scene, but was really hardcore to the left. Now, you can make the argument that he was too left, and I think that that's valid. But what really comes down to here is name recognition and fundraising. One candidate had $100,000 to their name, and the other had $2 million. And they decided to endorse the candidate with $100,000. The candidate with $100,000, who, again, we do like- Very much. Is, is very likely going to end up being the spoiler if she doesn't win. Because his the amount of voting that he ended it's going to come down to little, that was about five percent, and yeah. he uh, pulled from her 
absolutely pulled from her. And and again, the the issue, you know, again, in, in, in Jabari, I, you know, this, this ain't a time for an argument. I'm basically saying if you know the district and you know that if you make certain comments that are going to be incendiary and they're going to drive the core. Right. We don't base, think it's too left. He we're, was we're suggesting about it like, from the people who are actually correct, going to go out to the polls. That, that he when he yeah. made the comment that he did about supporting BDS, that that was too far left for the district. That's what he meant. Not we're not making a personal assessment. And again, on Sheila, it. Sheila wasn't um, somebody who was advocating um, you know, <clears throat> for MMT the way that um, the way that Omari Hardy, the, that gentleman's name, the way that he was advocating for. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to win and you're trying to enact change, the left has to get better at strategy. That is something oh that is severely lacking. And I would imagine that that is something that you have seen is something that we are really lacking in the need to work on. Yeah. And also, it, again, this just speaks to ranked choice voting where there no one should be in that position where there is a spoiler. Like you should be able to vote for your favorite person. You should be able to vote for your second favorite person. You should be able to vote for your third favorite person. None of these should actually prevent who you most want from winning to win, creating the situation where the person that you really don't want to win wins. Um, there's no reason for that to happen. And I just, it's constantly been annoying to me. Um, just this, you know, ever since I've, I got into to voting, I mean, this is something that's annoyed me um, since, you know, 18, as, as far as this inability to, to vote for a third party or being the third party being blamed each time. And of course, you know, this also fits into primaries with third candidates, fourth candidates, everything else. Um, but there's always this blame on the voters for voting for someone other than like the top two. And there's this blame on, um, on the candidates for even running. Like how dare they run on, you know, these other issues and, and fight another option. Um, you only are allowed to really vote for two. I know it says that you can vote for others, but really, realistically, you can only vote for two. It's like, well, no, that's that's just crap. Like, we need to make a system where you actually can vote for who you want for, and then we don't have these problems, and you don't have these, the you know, friends eating each other. You wouldn't have progressives being their own worst enemy. Like, you could actually be forming these coalitions that are so important, and it would not be resulting in these worst outcomes. Yeah, I agree. And I definitely think that that is something that we did see. Uh, most people would agree that ranked choice voting, especially in a race that had so many candidates, uh, I think there was like uh, 11, something like that. And then 19, I think, was the total number. But we're talking about actual viability in terms of you know raising money, having a chance to win, got votes, things like that. And when you have that many candidates in a race, you would think that, all right, well, I like this candidate for this reason. I like this candidate for that reason. I'd like to support, you know, multiple candidates. And ultimately, I know there's only going to be one winner, but that's where the whole concept of ranked choice voting comes into play. And the one thing that Florida in particular is good about, we're not good at a lot of things, but we are good at getting ballot initiatives passed. That is one mm -hmm. thing that our state does well. Um, yeah. We, you know, again, this state went for Trump by like three and a half points, I believe. Uh, so that's by Florida standards, that's a comfortable win. And we still were able to pass a $15 minimum wage mm -hmm. and that took over 60% of the vote. Yeah. Actually more people voted for the $15 minimum wage than voted yeah. for Donald Trump. And that to me, I really do think speaks to the fact that we're not as divided as a lot of people think. And I brought, we brought this up, you know, with Andrew the other night, I really think that progressives and libertarians have a lot more in common than they don't. And we are forced to believe that there is sort of like this dynamic of, no, we are completely separate. We are not the same. No, there are philosophical differences in terms of how to spend money. I understand that. But overall, when it comes to things like even healthcare to this point, you know, civil liberties, the wars, things like that, there really is a lot that we can find common ground on. Again, there are a lot of differences, but there are a lot of similarities. Do you see the ability to really expand that coalition? Because I really think that that's what Andrew's trying to do here is just try to, you know, again, it's all about corporate special interest money. You can cast the net as wide as you want. I'll work with anybody as long as they're not bought and paid for by the machine. Are you feeling the same way? Yeah, yeah. I, I have, I've long felt that that 
if you were to you know look at the left and right, there's kind of like a top and bottom to so there's kind of like a quadrant, and there's no reason at all where you can't find these these coalitions um, instead of pegging people into one of only two groups, especially to say like, oh, you're either a racist or not a racist. Like that's a terrible way to divide all of the country and just ignoring all policies and everything. Like if you ask people about specific policy questions, then there's going to be a lot of agreement uh, between you know, all sides, right? between centrist Democrats and centrist Republicans, between progressives and actually libertarians, that there are things we can agree on. But then instead, there are actually, you know, when it comes to these real kind of tribal issues, um, especially things that are made hyperpartisan, then people will vote along those lines. Um, you know, we're even seeing that, you know, through through COVID as far as like, like that was just one of the worst things ever, I feel, as far as how the vaccines themselves were made to be partisan. And then you had mask wearing be made, you know, very partisan. And so you've got this like really weird divide now where like, you know, wearing a mask or getting vaccinated is the way you express being in a particular tribe. And that tribe votes in a specific way. And that's right. it. Like that's the most important thing is this one thing. Um, it has to be, you know, you go down the ballot and see they're all red or all blue and nothing else matters. Um, you know, but it's, it's not accurate and, and we should actually, um, enable people to really be more policy focused and be more coalition focused. And again, yeah, it really comes down to structure. As long as we're in this system where there is a spoiler effect and there's this, this two parties where you have to choose one or the other, then it's going to end up being this way so yeah that's why we have and to i so like your that. shirt i like your shirt because your Thanks. shirt is the exact same is the point we are making and it's true that's exactly right we need to be going forward and but of course we know we're being purposefully distracted that by the establishment in both parties like to keep their people distracted and focused on like red flag things instead of you know actual the economy stupid you know, and, and that's yeah. sort of to me. And I feel like it is intentional. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.